Welcome back to True Story with John Gibson. Today we have Jake Shields. Jake is a MMA and BJJ legend. He's done it all. He's fought for the UFC, WEC, Bellator, Strikeforce, everything. Uh, it's a huge honor to have you, Jake, man. Thanks for joining me. Oh, thank you, man. You got me a good time just out here, uh, stuck in the hotel out in uh, Mohegan Sun, Connecticut, just getting ready to uh, corner my guys in a couple hours. Yeah, thank you for that. Exactly. Yeah, he's been extremely busy. Can you can you talk a little bit about that? Let's talk about your fighter. I mean, number one contender, right? It's big night. Yeah, I'm out here with uh, Apache Mix. He's ranked number two in Bellator. Extremely talented. He uh, actually lost his last fight, a really close decision for the for the title. So try to get him back on track. Um, I'm new to training him. The kid was already extremely talented, you know, before I've dealt with him. But I think we're uh, I think we're making huge improvements. That's the thing is, the kid's already so good, but he's like he's far off from his potential. So you see someone who's like so talented and raw, he has a good work ethic. He's, he pretty much got himself here with, you know, with, with training partners, not world-class level. You know, he had, he had some coaches helped him, of course, but guys, not guys that have ever dealt with big fighters before. So I think for him, uh, he's been coming to Vegas recently now around all kinds of uh, top pros and top coaches. Mm -hmm. He's just, uh, he's excelling and I expect yeah. him, you know, obviously he has a tough fight in front of him tonight, but I expect him to get through and uh, get another title shot. For sure. Well, I'll be watching and rooting for him for sure. And, and you're right, man, steel sharpens steel. So what a great mm -hmm. opportunity for him to kind of come under your wing and get some mentorship and be surrounded by other fighters, talk to your guys and kind of level up. Right? Yeah, like I said, the guy, you know, the guy, the guy obviously had help where he was at, but it's guys that, you know, smaller gyms, guys who've never dealt with world uh, championship level. So him to step up and now be around a bunch of like world championship level fighters and coaches, it's like he's just like, he's excelling. And I expect uh like I said, he's already been so successful with what he's done. So I expect him to step to the next level and uh, win some world titles. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, switching gears a little, is it crazy for you to, uh, you know, you were the fighter for so long, man. You were the guy at the top of the marquee and and now you're you're kind of more of a mentor. Is that sort of a different sort of perspective for you? Yeah, a little bit. You know, it's a little, um, I, I've always coached a little bit, so it's mm -hmm. not that different. You know, I helped coach Gil Melendez quite a bit. I've you know, mm -hmm. ran a lot of his camps. I helped, you know, I've, I've taught jujitsu, so it's it's obviously different stepping in, especially some of these guys I haven't known as long. So it's a little weird. You got to get to, uh, you got to get to know the guys who are training them. Yeah. You got to, to be a good coach, you don't coach everyone exactly the same. You got to right. like adjust their body types or their personality types. You're going to push people, different people different ways. So it takes, uh, you know, someone like Gil, obviously, been with years, he's easy to coach, you know exactly how to work with them. So working mm -hmm. with new people, it's uh, figuring out their personalities, how to push them, what makes them work, how to train them best. So it's been a, it's been kind of fun. I was never sure. really, I've always kind of casually helped train jiu-jitsu and people. So it's always my nature to help. So now I'm, yeah, I wasn't trying to be a coach or anything, but I moved mm -hmm. to Vegas and around, around so many fighters just kind of naturally started uh, taking a few of these guys under my wings and coaching them. For sure. For sure. What an awesome opportunity for them too, because you've seen and been around the fight game, jiu-jitsu game so long mm -hmm. that, I mean, you have such a wealth of experience and it's crazy because Jake, I became a fan of yours first through MMA and then I discovered BJJ later. And then I started seeing your BJJ matches and I became like next level fan of yours. Oh, nice. Your style, man, your style is, is uh, in my words, you know, it's nonstop. You're pretty aggressive, but your technique is dude. It's awesome, man. You, it's mm -hmm. awesome. And, um, and, and I'm so inspired by you. Like truly still, I just celebrated my 38th birthday. I uh, just got a neck fusion and I was watching your, your match against AJ Algazarm. And Paul Harris yesterday. And man, I started mm -hmm. sweating. I was getting so pumped up, dude. <laughs> like, I'm such a fan of yours, man. Um, oh, man, I really appreciate it. Oh, it's so, it's just awesome. Your style is great. And you just, you bring it, you know, and you are authentically yeah. Jake Shields. That's just as real as it gets. So mm -hmm. I don't know how anybody couldn't love that. But uh, do you mind sharing maybe a little bit about maybe the AJ match or, or, or Paul Harris, one of the two, just some, you know, one of those crazy stories? Yeah, well, well both those matches, they, those, those are both interesting matches you picked. AJ was, um, I wasn't really following Jiu Jitsu at the time. That was when I first tried to compete again. I had no idea who mm -hmm. he was. And this kid was just like, uh, he was in an interview. He called in, started uh, telling him that he tapped me a bunch of training. I never heard of the guy. I'm like, who yeah. is this douchebag? Well, well, as soon as I took the match, everyone kept being like, oh, this guy's a douchebag he's going against. And then sure enough, he calls, starts talking shit. And then I see him at the weigh-ins and he starts talking crap to me there. He starts going, um, they had weird rules. If you didn't tap the guy, it was going to be a draw. So he comes to me and he goes, I'm going to get a draw with you. And he started bragging about that he was trying mm -hmm. to get a draw with me. Like he wasn't going to, he was going to try to stall. I'm like, what is wrong with this guy? So then I walked up and just dumped my, uh, dumped my soda on his head. <laughs> and he, and he sat there looking like an idiot. So that was, that was before the match, but I'm like, this guy's been talking crap to me all week. So I was like, I'll oh, screw this guy. Mm -hmm. He didn't, 
I think he was used to talking crap, nothing happening. So really, he was scared when I dumped the soda on his head. He's kind of stood there like an idiot. Mm-hmm. But then after that, during the match, he was talking crap, smacking me. So I ended up, um, that was a video that went viral where I slapped him a few times. And that, that went, uh, <laughs> it went, it went so viral, but, not, but because it was AJ, like everyone wanted to slap him. So it was one of those guys that was like, Oh God, thank God someone did it. And, mm-hmm. um, after AJ, AJ kind of grew on me a little bit. He ended up mm-hmm. friends with Nick Diaz. Yeah, so I, right. I see him yeah. occasionally now. We, we've hung out a couple of times. He can mm-hmm. still be a little obnoxious, but he's one of those guys that you're slowly like, all right, you, you learn to deal with him. Sure. Sure. If your friend's cool, you can be cool kind of a thing. Yeah. 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 It's an interesting oh, right. connection. I, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I would say that that was like the most ridiculous fight I've ever been involved with because it was um I was dominating the fight the whole fight and then he sits there and starts uh people think he, they hear he was gouging my eyes I think he's putting his fingers but he was taking his thumbs and like trying to gouge my eyes out I'm sitting there on full mount beating him up and he just starts gouging my eyes out mm-hmm. I'm, and I'm telling the ref and the ref's just being like oh don't worry about it I'll handle it but he like he gouged my eyes just over and over and the ref kept mm-hmm. doing nothing it was I can't believe the ref didn't jump in and just disqualify him that should have been instant disqualification but. The ref let it go, and mm-hmm. I was an idiot. I couldn't see between rounds, between the, the, I think it was the third and the fourth. He gouged my eyes like five times, and I was just completely mentally, you know, he can't see it. Yeah. It's pretty scary. That's the one time I've been scared in a fight. I should have just stopped the fight right then and, put, and contested and, you know, uh, a, a disqualification, but I went there and mm-hmm. kept trying to fight, not being able to see, and just kind of, when it couldn't see, it's hard to fight. Yeah. I mean, you were in the moment, and you're a fighter fighting. You're doing what you knew. Yeah, but- my mind is to always keep fighting. You know, looking back, yeah. that was stupid to keep fighting. My mind is always keep fighting, but I'm getting my eyes my eyes gouged. I thought about, like, biting them back or something, but then I probably didn't want to get disqualified. <laughs> yeah, you totally the did the right. Cheating I've ever seen in a fight, and the ref just – I think they kind of um secretly fired that guy after that because he was already yeah. known as a bad – I can't remember his name. He's already known as a bad ref. Yeah. The worst part is, though, in Nevada, instead of saying he was wrong, they tried sticking up for him, being like, oh, he did a good job. But I noticed they never saw him working after that. I think they right. realized that uh, they realized like how blatant that was. I could have sued if I would have lost. I could have easily lost an eye. Yes, my, easily. My, well, and, and yeah, I and watched could, that, Jake, again. I'm, I watch, I'm a fan of yours, and I watched that mm-hmm. Nevada State Athletic. When, they, when you went in front of them about that and you testified about the eye gouging yes. and all that, I watched it because I followed it closely. First of all, if Paul Harris isn't scary enough, and doesn't come with a mm-hmm. reputation of holding on heel hooks and things like that. You're man enough to go in there with this guy, and then he eye gouges. It's yeah. like you would yeah, never yeah. have considered that even happening. It's so far out of the realm of rules and everything, right? Yeah. So, so, uh, so that stuff has never happened. People, put, people, I've seen people like kind of poke fingers before, but I've never seen or heard of anyone trying to gouge someone's thumbs out with their eye. Mm-hmm. And the worst part, the ref just the ref just to ignore it. I mean, you, yeah. you can't like you can't see it that good in the video, unfortunately. But you can see what he's done to my eyes, and, the, and I was telling yes. the ref, the ref knowing who Paul Harris is because mm-hmm. I'm on mount, but he kept taking his thumbs and just gouging them out my eyes. I'm sitting there yelling at the ref and the ref, the ref's looking down, looking right at it. And he just mm-hmm. kind of ignores it. And he goes, and he's sitting there telling him, Hey, quit gouging his eyes. It should have been an instant. Oh, that should have been it right there. Like, how are you going to warn someone? And he just kept warning him over and over. Hey, I said, stop gouging his eyes. Like, what, what are you doing? Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. Especially if he says it verbally, that's you're right. Um, yeah. That's crazy, man. That's crazy. You know, kind of switching gears a little more too. Um, you know, in tandem with some of the coaching and stuff you're doing with the fighters, I still, I see you're still pretty active, like rolling BJJ with kind of like the Donnerher crew, right? Are you still yeah. sort of training with them when you can? Yeah, I mean, I can. Unfortunately, they all uh, relocated to uh, Puerto Rico. <laughs> yeah, they all ran I, away. I, I plan on going out there really soon. I'm sure yeah. I've never been to Puerto Rico. I'm sure it's great. But to me, I'm in New York often, so that was way easier mm-hmm. for me. I'm actually mm-hmm. going out to New York tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, so I'm bummed. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna see him. But I plan on taking a trip out to Puerto Rico soon, and I train with those guys again. Yeah, I bought an exciting bunch, and and those guys, what a cool group of. Uh, first of all, they're in my opinion, kind of the elite, the of the elite in the BJJ yeah. world. Um, and then it was just so cool to see that you kind of fell in there with the Craig Jones and these no gi specialists too. You know, Gordon, obviously, these guys. Uh, because I think you have a lot to offer that group too. And some of the mental yeah. toughness and stuff, it's pretty cool combination. Yeah, it was pretty cool. I got to be part of the, um, part of the two, two of the best, uh, best teams, one of the best teams in MA and one of the best teams in grappling. You know, I went from, you know, Nick mm-hmm. Diaz, uh, Nate Diaz, Gil Melendez being tight mm-hmm. with that crew and then moving to New York and coming in with other crew as they're coming up. It was kind of a similar situation when you got Gary Tone and yeah. Gordon Ryan and those guys all, all coming up together. So I was, uh, very fortunate to be part of two two amazing crews. I mean, obviously, I was really a scrap pack from the founding founding the mm-hmm. beginning, but it was still cool going to be a part of a uh, part of Donna Harris crew. For sure, yeah. What an amazing exactly two opportunities, once in a lifetime opportunities. I'm so glad you brought that other part up though too. 
uh, because I've, I'm friends with, uh, well, not friends. I've reached out a couple of times and had some dialogue with David Terrell before about coming oh, man, on the show. Guys. I love him. Like old OG fan. Love that mm-hmm. guy. Love his style. And uh, another Caesar Gracie black belt, like the first, I think. Um, yeah, he was the first. He was yeah. absolute savage. He used to, he used to destroy everyone. But I mean, to him, I think he enjoyed coaching more than competing. That, yeah. That's a guy who should have been the UFC champ. He definitely had the, without a doubt, had the ability. I just knew his end. He, wow. he, he liked coaching and training more than he liked going out there and fighting. It's uh, yeah, not easy to step out there. And some people don't love it. If you don't love it, it's hard to do. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't imagine why doing it if you didn't love it. <laughs> the sacrifice mm-hmm. is too much. I can't imagine for sure. Yeah, yeah. but he still, still trains. He's an amazing coach. He has a, he has a big group of just savage ass, ass jiu-jitsu guys up in Santa Rosa that he trains. Mm. I follow a couple of his students. He has a lot of really Northern California, Santa Rosa, right? Yeah. He, yep. um, he has a lot of kids students that are doing some really remarkable mm-hmm. things in some of the Nogi stuff, like really cool. Yeah. Stuff. No, he's, he's a phenomenal coach. He's just up there in kind of a smaller town. So he gets mm. kind of a, no one quite realizes it. They don't think they do big, many big tournaments and it's kind of hard when you're in a smaller area, yeah. but he's a phenomenal coach. That's awesome, man. And it's so cool. Like you said, to be a part of the original scrap pack too, man. Can you kind of talk a little bit about like, how did that, I mean, I, I'm, how did that happen so organically that you had you, Nick, Nate, Gilbert, all of these guys all in this one gym, like was Caesar, did he collect you guys? How did you find each other? You know, how did that happen? I mean, it was a combination of uh you know, Caesar, the right, right. Uh, he was a good coach, of course, but a lot of it was just we all happened to come to the same place at the same time. One, one smart thing Caesar did is uh, we were all really young, really broke kids, and he let us train there for free. That was brilliant to tell him. Mm-hmm. He saw the future in us, and we just uh, went and trained hard. Mm-hmm. Caesar, mind was, Caesar was also very open-minded at the time. A lot of the jiu-jitsu schools were closed-minded, like no leg locks. They didn't like wrestling. Mm-hmm. They didn't want to mix punches. And Caesar Gracie was like, oh, let's, let's mix it all up. Mm. And he would like, you know, we'd come in and teach wrestling. Someone else would come in and teach leg locks. He was always, he was always trying to learn himself the new stuff. So he stayed mm. on the cutting edge of new techniques and allowed, uh, allowed the gym just to flourish. And mm-hmm. we're all, obviously we're, we were hard workers too. We pushed each other. Yes. Like, so having a group that we were, we were very competitive, very, we we're very great friends. We're also very competitive with each other. So it kind of pushed us up together. Mm, that's interesting yeah caesar doesn't get enough credit for that very few people talk about and and of course he had to have done that stuff because you guys had leg locks you had the game yeah, yeah. so interesting yeah and that was back at the time they were most brazilians they like, go oh, leg locks are cheap don't do leg locks but he was like oh let's whatever works in mma let's get this stuff to work yeah for sure definitely yeah it's so yeah it's such a, a miraculous story too and and i guess you know as the life of a fighter man like it, how do you find the balance between like next month you may not know where you're going to be right you're, tr- you're trying to kind of find for like a new fight or match or something for a student and stuff to to finding just like everyday balance like you know you were able to fit me in you know in the middle of a bellator event and stuff like how do you do all that man it can't be easy yeah you, you gotta learn a little, a little different everything's got to be up on the go you can't like i don't like structure out plans far in advance because everything is based around your fight it's a little easier now that i'm not fighting because when you're fighting the highest level everything's based on your fight if you get a fight you cancel everything else you know it doesn't matter if it's doesn't matter what it is you know your friends weddings whatever you're like not nah, can't can't go your priorities are your fighting a little different now that i'm um it's not you, you know someone else's fight or uh mm-hmm. I, I if i have to i could miss it or if it's a grappling match or not quite as important it isn't like when a fight comes you have to take it so mm-hmm. But yeah, you have to just plan your life kind of according to when things pop up. You just get used to it. Sure. You live spontaneous and don't don't make plans far in advance. Yeah. Like when I travel, you know, I'd fight, I'd book something up, use a couple of days or if I had time off, I'd use it. I can book a trip. We got freedom. I figure out when I'm right. Like, oh, you know, I, sometimes I'll book something and fly out somewhere tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Smart planning ahead, just doing smart stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. You just, you just plan things last minute. Yeah. So I guess, and one more thing I, I prom Oh, I, Oh yeah. I promised myself if I ever met you or had a chance to talk to you, I'd bring this up. Um, so I was at your fight with Dan Henderson. It's the only fight yeah. I've ever seen you fight uh, live anyway. And I was I, from Nashville. I grew up there. Um, I, I remember after the fight, after the fight and kind of the music city brawl happened, I remember literally thinking to myself vividly going, this is going to be history. And then getting the hell out of there. <laughs> so, man, yeah. you were in the cage. You were in the middle of it. Can you break that down, what that chaos was like? I mean, oh, my gosh. What a crazy piece of uh, MMA history. Yeah, it was It was absolute chaos. I was after I beat Dan Henderson. It was a huge fight, obviously. Uh, I'd already beaten Jason Mayhem Miller. We'd been, I think, uh, feuding over Twitter and hadn't really liked each other. 
so we had a little bit of beef and kind of out of nowhere he hopped in the cage and ran for my face and uh yeah. you know my my adrenaline was pumped up and if i just ending i wasn't ready for it i seen miller coming towards me so i just reached over and punched him and then just uh that time jason miller was also training dan henderson's gym so we think we, we see his crew we figure they're uh it might turn into a big brawl i'm thinking so thinking a big brawl is gonna gonna uh bust out all of a sudden I, nick, nick nick jumps in nate jumps in uh <laughs> my brother Guillermo melendez everyone runs in a big brawl breaks uh breaks out or not quite we thought it would be a huge brawl but it was more just miller getting beat up i think yeah. most of us i think most of henderson's guys didn't really like him that much there's kind of like how oh, whatever just kind of yeah. get beat up we're not fighting for him it was crazy it was absolutely chaos and and uh you know shortly after that i i had my ticket this is a silly story but but i kept the ticket to that event because i'm like this is history <laughs> and yeah, then yeah, uh, the nashville cool flood event. happened and i lost it my car got completely sunk underwater oh no <laughs> but, so but it's fine i got this interview and we have this now so it all worked out but uh, yeah we have this instead man yeah, it's, it's it was just a, a crazy part of you know mma history it was just just a wild mm -hmm. time and and again it was one of those moments as a, a scrap pack fan no matter what you can't leave that and not kind of like have a little bit more respect for Jake Shields or, or Nick mm -hmm. or Gilbert. Like, it's just, it's just, you are who you are. And it was a, it was a pretty cool moment as a fan to have lived through. Yeah. Our, our crew was always, uh, we never started anything, but we were always down to uh, the scrap. We had to back something up. We always had each other's backs. Sure. So I guess, um, you know, one other thing I think I'd love to, to, I know that we, we have limited time, but another thing I'd love to pick your brain a little bit about too, is just that, man, you have, you know, you've put your body through it. You know, you've been active, like high level competitive for a very long time, but you look great. And like, I, I know, like, I feel like, and you are still competing, right? So you got to be moving yeah. pretty well. So what are you doing to take care of yourself, man? Do you have like, I know it may sound generic, but like, like, what are you doing to take care of yourself? I'm 38. So like your diet, any stretching, any sort of advice? Cause I'll, I'll do it. Yeah. Well, I've been, um, I've been vegetarian my whole life. So, I mean, I, I've never eaten meat, so I can't say if I'd feel different if I did. And I can't really compare it to that. I think that, uh, that probably helps some. And, um, other than that, I think it's just, you know, low, low stress. And, uh, mm. actually was having some lower back issues for a couple of years into my career. That's part of the reason why I kind of stopped fighting. I was having my back just kept going out uh, over and over, but luckily I've been able to, um, the last six months, my back hasn't gone out. I started, uh, I started deadlifting, but like really light because mm. I've heard it heavy deadlifts before. So just doing mm. like sets of like 20. And since then, I haven't had any back flare ups. I'm hoping, uh, hoping that lasts. But I had about two or three years of my back just in and out constantly, which kind yeah. of led me to stop biting. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that. It sounds like you're getting past some of that and, and able to strengthen mm -hmm. that up for sure. Man, I, I am this close to being a vegetarian. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm this close. I, you're the third person that I highly respect that has told me that that's what they're doing. And uh, last week we had Chris Bird. He's a two-time heavyweight boxing champ on the show. Mm -hmm. And uh, he beat Holyfield. He beat Klitschko. And he announced his comeback. Um, he's trying to put together a fight with, uh, uh, oh, geez, Oscar. I, I don't know if that'll happen or not. But um, yeah. he's trying to put the fight together. And I, I asked him the same question. I was like, man, you, you're in better shape now than you were when you fought Holyfield. And he goes, I went vegan. <laughs> I'm like, oh, wow. Oh. So, yeah. okay, <laughs> I might do this. Yeah. Yeah. The thing is too, you can, you could always eat like small amounts of meat. People don't have to do stretch. I think, I think a lot of people do really well with small amounts because I've mm -hmm. had a, a lot of friends have done it and they say if they go fully, like vegan or vegetarian too quick, sometimes they feel a little weak, but mm -hmm. they'll eat meat like twice or twice a week. They say they feel good. Okay. And sometimes right. they end up going all the way over, but that's usually what I recommend people to start like, Hey, eat it twice a week and then see how you feel from there. So you said you've done it your whole life. I guess it was your parents' influence. They were just. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I grew up that way. So for me, it was it was, it was easy. I don't ever miss it. I never eat it. So I don't crave yeah. it. And the few times I did eat, did eat it, my stomach would nod up and I would get sick. My body's uh, not used to taking it. So for me, yeah. I prefer not to eat it. Yeah, that's super, man. I'm uh, okay. I'm this close. Like I said, I won't. I'm one of those people. I don't want to say I'm going to make the commitment because then I'm in. But I'm so close. Yeah, exactly. But but you're yeah. considering it. Yeah, really, really considering it for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I I really do appreciate all of this having the time to to you know, chat it with you and get to know you a little more. Um, again, before I, I let you go though, where can everybody reach you? What's kind of the best place if they want to connect with you, if they have questions or, or, or want to contact you? Um, I mean, I don't know exactly. I mean, you could try, uh, I mean, um, Twitter or, um, Instagram, sometimes DM, sometimes I answer, sometimes they don't. It depends on if I'm like busy, you get a lot of messages, mm -hmm. but, uh, it's not a hundred percent, but it's definitely worth that. Worth a shot reaching out there. Sure. Sure. So, well, yeah, it's worth a shot there for sure. 
Um, I really do appreciate this again. Any maybe uh, final thoughts or anything other than, uh, of course, we're going to be watching tonight and watching your fighter and, and, and seeing you there cornering. Um, anything yeah. else? Anything else coming up? Any more grappling matches or anything we can uh, look forward to? Yeah, I you? don't. I have a few grappling offers. I'm just trying to figure out my, my schedule. Super busy right now with training a few guys. So I'm trying to, uh, to source that out. with Because I, I want to grapple soon. It's been a while. And I want to – now that I'm feeling healthy again, my last couple matches I wasn't feeling healthy. So I'm feeling healthy. So I'm excited to get back out there. Sure, sure. Yeah, well, keep me posted. And then uh, for sure we'll support it here and, and I'll be watching. And uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, this was True Story again, John Gibson and Jake Shields. Jake, thank you cool. so much again for joining me. Awesome, man. Great talking to you. Thanks, bud.